I want to welcome you today. Uh, we're going to start our third program on the subject of the oil. And as you already know, if you've been watching, oil, of course, in the, in the scripture is a, a type of the Holy Spirit. And when we left yesterday, we were dealing with uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 27, talking about the teaching, uh, the teaching of the Holy Spirit. This, this truth, um, you could never you could never bring to bear how precious and how important it is. Uh, you and I, true Christianity is not a matter of intelligence. It's not even a matter of how often you read the Bible, although you should, absolutely should. But you can read the Bible every day of your life if there is not the illumination, yeah. if there is not the explanation of the Holy Spirit, it's not going to do and be what it should be. There is nothing more precious. Brian uh, said this to me. We were in the studio at the radio, I think, uh, last week, or maybe it was even the first week that we were doing programs together on Standing Up. And he said, uh, you know, he said, when there's not revelation, I get bummed or, or bored, or I can't remember the words you used. And I thought, man, how true that is. Uh, David Wilkerson said this when he was still alive. He said, the joy of my life is that moment that the Word of God becomes alive to me, that God will show me something I've never seen before, that God will take the veil once again and roll it back, and I, for that moment, for that instance, I am in the presence of God. I am seeing things that only heaven could show me. I thought what Juliana said yesterday was very, very, very powerful, how that First John t uh, chapter 2 and 27 that the teaching, uh, and I'll go ahead and read it, but it says, but you have the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and, teach, and, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. There's so many things that are said there, but she said yesterday that, that she uh, felt like, excuse me, felt like that was a uniting a uniting force, a uniting truth of the Holy Spirit, that if the Holy Spirit is teaching everybody, he's going to teach everybody the same thing. I think one of the things that uh, can, can feel very arrogant and very proud, but if a man or a woman is not or is a man or woman of God, it never comes across that way. But you should never be scared of somebody saying, um, I'm going to pray about what you're teaching. I'm going, to, I'm going to ask the Lord about what you're teaching. That should not scare anybody. In fact, Paul encouraged people to search the scriptures and see whether or not these things were so. Uh, if you're preaching doctrine that is, that is the word of God, it will stand the test of scrutiny. It will stand the test. In fact, I'll tell you something. It will stand the test of somebody that doesn't even like you, but they will not be able to deny they they may they may not attend your church, but it won't be on the it won't be on the, it will not be on the basis of whether what you're teaching is scriptural or not. They will have to find other reasons. Uh, this is an incredible truth, because here's what this removes: this removes uh, how intelligent or not intelligent somebody is. It removes how educated or uneducated people are. It removes all of that. It removes all of that. Listen, I'll tell you, I'll never forget this. When I was a young, young, young man, I probably had only been saved maybe a year or a year and a half. And in that time, uh, our church belonged to an organization called the Fellowship of Christian Assemblies. And uh, I went with Pastor Kevin usually to every, to every meeting that they would have. I just would always end up going. And this particular time, uh, call me judgmental, whatever, but this particular time, we went to Wenatchee, and there was a, a, a church that belonged to our fellowship in Wenatchee, and this man was sponsoring the meeting, and his building, probably, I don't know what it said, 150 people. Uh, it was an older building. You could tell that they had put a lot of work to refurbish it, and, and I want to apologize ahead of time for what I'm about to say, but when he got up to lead the service, and he was going to minister to us for a minute before he turned the service over. He was uh, uneducated 
uh, he was gangly. His movements were really, were really uh, weird. Almost, uh, if you were not saved, if you were not uh, a man, you, you would almost want to laugh. He was awkward in the way his body moved. I can't even put it into words. He, he, you, like I said, you could tell he was uneducated. And in my mind, I judged him. And in my mind, I remember even looking at Pastor Kevin and kind of smirking. And, and Pastor Kevin just, he never smiled at me. He didn't reprove me, but he just looked at me and then he looked away from me. And I'll never forget when that man opened his mouth. To this day, I remember what he said. And I cried and I cried. I cried all the way home, off and on, from Wenatchee until I got home. Off and on, I cried all. You could have, you, you could almost feel the presence of God come into that building. And I remember a good friend of mine that was, at the time, my best friend. And he came over the, the next day and he woke me up. I, I don't know, I was sleeping in or whatever, but he came and he woke me up and he came in my room and he goes, hey, lazy, get up, you know, and and he goes, how was that meeting yesterday? And his name was Jimmy Parker. And I said, Jimmy, there was such an anointing on this man. And I remember relating to him the things that that man had said that day. And what, what this verse is telling us is it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter whether you graduated from high school or college or the third grade. If you, because... This revelation, this teacher, is attached to your spirit, not your soul. It's not attached to your natural intellect. This teacher is, listen, there is no uh, little or big Holy Spirit. There's no child-sized Holy Spirit. There's one Holy Spirit, and he can teach anybody. He can get beyond the boundaries of, of your intellect or, or even uh, challenges that you have in your ability to learn. He can get beyond all of that. Yeah. And, and, and I just wanted to say that I have thought of that man over and over and over again. I have thought of him. I don't even, he probably is not even alive anymore. He was uh, kind of an older man even then. But I'll never forget that. I'll never forget the lesson God taught me in that, in that moment. And, and so this teacher that we have, this this. Uh, this, this manifestation of the person of the Holy Spirit. How many of us, how many Christians walk around and never consult this teacher? They never ask for the help of the teacher that lives and abides in them. I often get this visual in my mind when I'm reading the scripture. I often get this visual of, of uh, Jesus standing behind me or the Holy Spirit standing behind me and pointing over my shoulder and putting his finger on a, on a scripture and saying, you know what that means? This is what that means. And I'll tell you something. I have learned, I have learned, uh, I don't use commentaries much anymore, and it's not because I think I'm smart. I use them once in a while, but mostly I lean on the Holy Spirit. And I'm not saying that to sound spiritual or arrogant. I, 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 I invested thousands of dollars in commentaries when I was a younger man, and I don't think I know everything. It's just I think I've exhausted what somebody else can show me. And, and I'm not saying I know everything, because I don't, but I'm saying that generally speaking, I think I've exhausted what another person can show me. But you'll never exhaust what the Holy Spirit can show you. You'll never, ever, ever, ever get to a place where you will know so much that you don't need the help of the Holy Spirit. In fact, I'll tell you something. Any man or woman that's genuinely walking with God senses their need more and more and more. Every time you preach, every time you minister, every time you teach, there's a sense of, I can't put this into words, but it's real, it's true, it's honest. And that is, I never stand on the front row of this building, nor do I get into cross class or wherever thinking I've got this. I, I, know, I know what to do. I never feel that way. I feel utter helplessness. I feel utter dependence upon the Spirit of God every single time I open this book. Because more and more and more you learn that you are helpless without the help, the anointing, the teaching. Everybody knows this. Everybody knows that knows God and that is, it has ever been in the presence of anointing is you know the moment, you know the moment that the human teacher has disappeared and the heavenly teacher has come. And there's just something that happens in the spirit world in that moment. 
But I want to look at a, a, a scripture that I think is attached to this in the book of Isaiah. And it's, ver, it's, it's chapter 10 and verse 27. And it says this, And it shall come to pass in that day. And I think this is speaking of the days of the, the coming of the Holy Spirit. That his burden shall be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck. And the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. And what that's talking about, I think this goes along with the anointing, speaking of the teaching anointing that you and I have as a child of God, that we have the Holy Spirit, the anointed teacher of the Holy Spirit living in us. Because what this verse is really saying is it's not talking about, when we think of a yoke being broken, uh, we often get the picture in our mind of, of somebody punching or, or hitting or with a... With a an instrument of some kind in breaking. If you know what a yoke is, he's talking about the yoke that went around an oxen's neck and, and it was attached, of course, to the, to the, um, uh, the plow. Yeah, the plow. And, uh, and, and, and it was attached to the plow and it pulled the plow. And, and so when we think of a yoke being broken, we get the visual of, of somebody you know, breaking it off or whatever. But that's not what this says. The, the Hebrew actually implies that this yoke is burst. It's, it, it, it actually is broken off. It bursts off because the animal is growing and the yoke can't hold. It, can't, it doesn't fit anymore. And it simply is burst off of it. And, and what this is really saying is not something from the outside breaking the yoke. It's something from the inside that is breaking the yoke. And this thing that's breaking the yoke from the inside is what you're being taught. It is teaching that breaks the yoke. When I learn, for instance, when I learn that the sin nature is not my responsibility to deal with, that's, that's Jesus' response. That's the Holy Spirit's responsibility. When I learn that, at that point, there is a yoke broken. Why? Because up until that time, I have the weight of trying to conquer the unconquerable on my own person. I can't do that. I'll never do that. I'll never win. And so what teaching does is teaching reveals to me what is my responsibility and what is God's responsibility. And you know something? The longer you walk with God, the more you'll understand your responsibilities are pretty small. God's responsibilities are pretty big. My responsibility really is, it really lies in one thing. My responsibility is to believe. It is to believe what the scripture tells me, that Jesus took care of the sin nature at his death. And I am to identify with that death by faith. And by faith, his death becomes my death. And Galatians 2.20 says that in the spirit world, I am dead to the sin nature. Amen. That in the spirit world, it can't find me. Because every time it tries to find me, whatever it is, the forces of darkness, when they try to find me, they run into Jesus. Yes. I'm hidden in Christ. I disappear into the person of Christ. And so this anointing, listen, this anointing will show you what nobody else can. This anointing, hear this, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, for instance, was not publicly taught. I, I should say it was not taught in the church from roughly around maybe 150 A.D., and that's probably giving credit uh, a little bit by maybe as much as 50 years but, but maybe 150 A.D. until 1900. So you're talking about 1,750 years the church knew nothing about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, what happened? What changed? Because at God's right time, the teacher, the teacher that abides, the teacher that was in uh, um, uh, Frank Bartleman, and uh, who's the other guy at Azusa Street? The black guy. William Seymour. William Seymour. And, and men like this, and men and women like this all over the world, the teacher said, it's time. The teacher said, and he began to teach, and he began to show, and he began to open the word of God. And all of the sudden, something was given back to the church that had been stolen from the church for almost 18 centuries. These men were not taught. They taught other men, yes, but they were not initially taught. It was the teacher. It was the teacher within them that brought this to life. Listen, I'm going to tell you something, and I, I'm not trying to, uh, I'm not trying to um, uh, you know, show f favoritism, whatever. 
But over and over and over and over again, the men and women that attend this church, and I'm not just saying Valley Christian Fellowship, but over and over and over and over again, somebody will call me, somebody will text me and say, God showed me this in the Word of God. I couldn't have showed him that because I didn't see it. I didn't know it to so I didn't know it to show him. God showed him that. I've I've had people text me things that I think, holy cow, how did I never see that? Holy cow, that is a great word. That is a great, that'll preach. Over and over and over, Cindy and I would say, How in the world did they see that? I've never seen that. We've never even taught them that. How did they see that? Because the teacher that abides, the teacher, when you turn to him, when you say, I don't know what to do, when you say, I can't understand the word of God, when, I, when you say, I don't under, Lord, I know there's truth in this, but I just don't know how to get a hold of it, that is where you're turning to the only person that really can show you. And when you do that, he will respond a hundred times out of a hundred times. Always. The problem is, the problem is that so often life has to maneuver us into a place where there are no answers. Nobody can tell you something that will encourage you. Nobody can show you something that'll get you out. Nobody can tell you something to make things stop. And you finally go to the only one that can. Anybody want to hop in here? Well, I was thinking of uh, what you said earlier. You said about uh, David Wilkerson. The, he said that uh, the joy of, of his life is revelation. Absolutely. And uh, I think about that as well. I think like the, for my own self as a personal testimony, my most wonderful time that I have is in the morning when I'm sitting there studying. Come on. And all of a sudden something pops Come up. Come on. And now all of a sudden I'm, I'm excited because I've just got, so I've received something new. And Hallelujah. then and then a lot of times it will lead to another thing. That's right. And it will lead to another thing. And I thought about, and as you were talking about that, I thought about this scripture that kind of links up to that. And it's the joy of the Lord uh, It's that is our strength, yes. right? The yes. joy of the Lord is my strength. Well, just think of it this way. Revelation is, is food. Uh, the Bible says that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Well, when you receive food from the mouth of God, that's joyful. Come on. And then you get Come strong on. and you get nourished. And, and it's exciting to study the word of God and get revelation because it keeps you alive. Yes. It keeps you spiritually strong. Amen. Amen. Joni? And on Revelation I, I just kind of been listening for the last couple sessions, and it's amazing to me because this morning I texted Pastor Randy and Pastor Cindy because I got this amazing revelation. And when I think of revelation, before I tell you what it was, anyways, when I think of revelation, and I think Lauren Larson taught me this, but um, he says that revelation is a doorway to something deeper. That's right. And so when God reveals something, it's like, we get excited, but he wants us to open the door and go deeper, go deeper with him. Because sometimes we get so excited about the revelation that we just run around telling everybody about it. But the truth is, is he's got more. He, there's so much more in that revelation. That's why I like what you said, where you said, and then there's more, and then there's more. So anyways, as I'm sitting here listening to these last couple sessions and thinking about what God was telling me, but, and it's weird, this is the second time this year that, that God used pastor randy to reveal some things about my own life um but he was telling me this morning that i just felt the impression from god that you know and at this anyways i don't want to say this weird but um he's always told me that i don't know how to say this okay so pastor randy is um hungry and he's desperate for God. And he's always showed me that whenever I leave Pastor Randy preaching and stuff, I, I always leave here thinking I need to get along with God. Like on a sunny morning, I'll leave here and think, I don't even want to talk in the car. I just want to get home. I want to get along with God. Um, and so I've always kind of felt like he's just a man of God. But this morning when I was working out, I felt like the Lord told me, God, gave, God gives revelation to Pastor Randy. And sorry that I'm talking about it like this, but God gives Pastor Randy revelation because he needed it. And I was thinking about that as I was working out and thinking, God gives us everything that we need. And if I get to a place where, I'm, where I get before God because I'm desperate to hear from him or I have this need, he will answer the need, and it is through revelation. And so anyways, that's, that's what I was thinking about. Well, on the topic of revelation, 
um, before I, I kind of grew up in the church or with an understanding of church life. Um, but never fully participated in it until I came here to um, Orville. And I never heard of Revelation. I knew that there was a Bible. I knew that there were things that, you know, God had to say in this, but I didn't know that they went deeper. I didn't know that there was, this is just a surface and we're supposed to, um, you know, dive into it. And so, like what Joni says, that there's there's always more. And, the, you know, Revelation, I don't think we realize how hungry we are for it until we first have experienced right. it. That's right. Because when, for me, when God shows me something, when I read one verse and he reveals an entire book in my head off of one verse, to me, that is the most intimate yeah. thing that you could ever experience. It's, it's like something God is showing me and then he tells me so much more that's not in this book and he pertains it specifically for me and it just becomes this amazing, beautiful relationship with God because he knows everything about me. And my journey is to know everything about him. And I'm only going to find this out in here. And I could read these words and I can. And there's people out there. They read the Bible, but they don't know. Or the word that we are familiar with is they don't get no yeah. They don't. Yeah. Um, it's it's so much more beyond than just what you're reading. It is an experience, Amen. is what it is. Amen. And and also just on another thought, I was thinking about this, and, I, and Pastor Randy, we were talking about this um, on the radio program earlier, and that is uh, is that basically uh, in the Old Testament, God had rained manna down uh, onto the land so that the people could eat some some food. Well, the meaning of manna it means what is it? In other words, it's it's revelation. Uh, in the New Testament, Jesus goes on, he says this, he says, uh, I am the true bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Now, what's interesting about this is there was, uh, God had rained down manna every day except for one day. Uh, and, and the point is, is we need fresh revelation. That's right. Fresh That's right. revelation. It's not just one. We, we get one revelation and, and another revelation will lead to another revelation. God gives us fresh revelation. That's what keeps us going. Because a revelation today uh, may not be what we need for tomorrow. And so there is a need for fresh revelation. Yes. Amen. Julia. Well, and I, I just think about how um, sometimes what happens is we can live on experience rather than living in Christ, yeah. you know. And I love, I, the revelation is great because it means to take the top off. It means to uh, unveil something. Yes. We've talked about that already. But, you know, it's interesting because if we really think about it, you know, God was silent for 400 years. Yeah. And so oh, sometimes horrible. what happens is, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer, but, um, you know, uh, sometimes we, because revelation is important. It's God speaking. It's the God of all creation speaking into the heart of man. Yeah. Yeah. And why, why do we get revelation? We sometimes, and I'm not saying we do that in this church, but, you know, um, I remember, you know, when I was in the word of faith, that was the big, it was a buzzword, you know. There were a lot of buzzwords, but revelation was one. And people would kind of go around, and it was worn as a trophy, really. And, uh, you know, people would talk about what, you know, what their big revelation was, and everybody would go, yeah, you know, I had this vision, and everybody was all about that, you know. He's, oh, wow, he had this great, real great vision and revelation. But the thing is, is that God, he's not silent anymore because he's given us the Holy Spirit. Yeah. We get to hear God. We don't. Can you imagine living in 400 years of silence? No. I would no. die if I didn't get to hear God, because you can't do that. You can't bring it out about. We can't make that happen. But here's my point: is that God speaks to us because, as it's already been said here, it's about intimacy. It's about relationship because He wants us to know Him more. Yeah. It's not. You know, one of the things I would never. If I was married, I would never go tell everybody about my intimate time right. with right. my husband. Right. There are some things that need to be kept. Absolutely. Mary pondered them yes. in her heart yes. because here's why. I believe there are things that are be to be shared and there are things to be cared That's for. Right. And one of the reasons is because the shared things God knows and we need that's why we need discernment. God knows what's to be shared because it will encourage people and and it will stir hunger. Yes. But then there's things to be cared yeah. and carried because it will cause people to go, well, I don't, and we're not responsible for, you know, we can't, people have to have their own deal with 
God. But sometimes it can be it can come across as arrogant, and people right. think I will never hear God like that. Now, again, on the other side of that coin, we're not responsible. We can't walk around on eggshells. But what what is the motive of my heart and what I'm sharing is right. what I'm trying to say <clears throat> here. And so, but it is revelation is a beautiful. I love what Brian said. I love the manna because the manna came down. I was just reading that in Matthew today about you know um, uh, the bread. You know, would a father give, uh, if a son wanted, uh, you know, would he give him a stone and all that? And, and the thing is, and your father gives you more. Well, God gave us the bread of heaven and the living water. Yes. He feeds us. He will care for us. So the, that's a beautiful picture of the man. Yeah. But anyway, so my point is that revelation is so that we can know Jesus. God gives us revelation for the purpose of knowing Christ more. Amen. You know, <clears throat> I think it's a horrible thing that uh, Catherine was talking about. I was raised in a, in a, in a church, uh, and, and not, not, to, not to speak ill of any church, uh, but I was raised in a church that also did not teach that God spoke, um, that, that you could hear God. We're not obviously talking about an audible voice, but, but the inner voice of the Holy Spirit right. is more powerful because it comes from within, not outside, right. you know? And, and so, but I was, I was never taught that. And, you know, my pastor used to use this really, <laughs> just a really basic uh, example of something. He said, you know, you can't tell somebody else what a peach tastes like because he loved peaches. Mm -hmm. And he said, unless you can't make somebody else want one until you've had one. Yeah. He said, well, if you've ever had a fresh peach off of a tree, mm -hmm. And he said, and you're telling somebody else about it. He said, just your telling creates a hunger in yeah. them. Yeah. They'll go, man, I, I want. And that's what he talked about. When you tell people what God can be, all that he can do, yeah. how real he can be, how personal he can be. You know, my mother was a woman of prayer, but, but Pastor Kevin was the first man I ever saw that knew God. Yeah. I mean, really, truly knew God. And... And it, it, something came alive in, in my heart when uh, I will never forget the first time I ever heard him pray. And something came alive in me. And, and I said, you know, nobody ever taught me. I'd never been around it. But I said, that's God, and that's what I've been looking for my whole life. Awesome. And from that moment, you know, Joni, I want to say this. Um, when you were saying that when you leave, you want to get alone with God, you know, that's that's what I always want on my life. Mm -hmm. You know, that's to me, that is what God intended mm -hmm. for a leader is not to be seen. Now when people leave, I want to be like him or I want to preach like her or teach like her or mm -hmm. sing like he does. But when I leave, it makes me want to go find Jesus, yes. you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the mark, I think, mm -hmm. of the working of the Holy Spirit on anybody. Yes. And... You know, I hope and pray that statement makes me want to run back and say, Jesus, I need you, because that's what I want to leave on somebody's life. Um, I remember you would remember her, Jessica. Maybe, I don't know if you were at Ruth's house yet, but there was a young woman that was at Ruth's house, and she, man, she was a mouthy, she was a mouthy student. And uh, Cindy and I were gone. Uh, we were gone somewhere, and we came home. And she, she, was, she was a fight. And something had changed in her. And Pastor John had preached that Sunday morning. And she was telling me, she said, when I left church Sunday morning, she said, I wanted to be more like Jesus. And I knew that Pastor John had been anointed because that's the mark of the anointing. And, you know, that right there, is the hope of every church in the world is that when you are teaching and ministering the word of God or whether you're a worship leader or whatever you're doing, that when people come out of that, they say, I want to be more like Jesus, yeah. you know? Amen. We're out of time for today. We'll pick it up on tomorrow's program. We hope and pray that this has ministered to you. It's helped you. And uh, we hope and pray that these programs uh, keep you company during this weird, weird season. So Lord, keep you, 
bless you, keep you healthy, and we'll see you on the next program.